developer, and therefore you'll be good for another couple of weeks. So that's why if you try to launch an app with voice commands and it doesn't recognize it, maybe just try to launch the app manually first to make sure that Cortana remembers. There you go. So that was it for step two. <clears throat> step three is actually handling the voice command once you're inside your app. So once again, this is where we're going to see some serious C sharp. I'm showing you the Windows runtime example. So this is on Windows Phone 8.1. Um, at the beginning, Cortana is the one that's hearing this phrase. She's passing it in through the system to the app class for your app. So this is where you, um, this is where the the actual recognition is passed in, and you handle that, and then you determine what the code path should be in your app because that app class is going to determine which page to pass the user to, depending on what command they spoke and what options they, they spoke. So then your page handles that and it maps the intent with the action, what exactly should happen. So now what you're looking at is what you would find in the app class. This is what would come in um, uh, when the user first spoke a command, Cortana recognized it, she br it brings it into here and notice that the first line here is if the kind is activation kind voice command. That means if they entered the app by way of a voice command, as opposed to maybe they, re they, um, uh, they launched the app from the start screen or uh, any of the various other ways this app could be reactivated or launched. In this case, it was launched by way of voice command. So you need to know that and you need to handle that in here. Now, when it's launched by way of voice command, you get this voice command activated event args object, which contains a speech recognition result. So that's the vargs result right here. And that, if we look at the first rule path in that, we get a, what's, what we are going to store here as the voice command name. So this is the name of the command from your VCD that they've chosen. So in this case, there was either the find one or there was the natural language processing one. So then we'll switch on that voice command and it was either find text or NLP command. If you looked back at the VCD, you'd see both of those. And we as the developer determined that if it was find text, we want to send them to the um, find text page. And if it was NLP command, we want to send them to the NLP command page. So that's, that was just our choice. So here we've been sent to a page. <clears throat> in this case, we're on the findtext.xaml.cs page, and we're in the onNavigated2. So the onNavigated2 here fires when we first get to that page, and we know, because we made it, that we're expecting a speech recognition result to be the parameter that was passed into this page navigation. So we know that e.parameter is a speech recognition result, so we can grab it and we can work based off of it. So what are we going to do here? Well, the first thing that we're going to do is if, they, if the command was find text, then we look at the semantics and see if they added some, some uh, search terms. So they may have, remember, they may have just said find or they may have said find XYZ. If they said find XYZ, then we're going to find that the semantics collection contains XYZ and we have access to that search term. So now we can not only like bring them to the search page, but we can automatically do a search for XYZ. So then the last thing that we need to do there is, and that reset, let me try that again. The last thing we need to do there is, um, oops, that's the, there we go. The last thing, once again, that we need to do is handle the command. And I'm on the next slide. Uh, that's, that's the wrong slide, but there we go. We need to either handle the find text with the search terms, or we need to handle it without any search terms whatsoever. And then they, we may also have been navigated to the other commands. So in this case, we're using the NLP command.xaml.cs. And I'm actually going to show you the rest of the handling of this one in a later module where we talk about what to do when you're accepting freeform text from the user and you want to handle that by way of a natural language uh, processing algorithm. Okay? So we'll skip right over that. Now, you do have access, and this is really important. Whenever your app is activated and you get this, uh, this um, speech recognition command, you have a, a property in here that tells you whether or not the user spoke it or typed it. Now, why would you want to know that? Because if they typed it, 
you don't want to talk back to them. Exactly. This is an absolutely critical decision, mm -hmm. and we'll look at this in the design guidelines. You never want your app to talk to the user if they haven't first talked to it. You never, in fact, want to talk to the user unless they are explicitly expecting it. And this is the way you handle that whenever they've come in through the voice command path, because you can find out whether they have uh, done that by way of voice or by way of type. And it's a common mistake, because sometimes um, developers assume that if there were parameters for the voice command, then automatically that meant, hey, voice commands were used, so I'm allowed to speak back. That's right. But just because it's called voice commands, you can still get those parameters if the voice command was typed directly in Cortana. So that's really important. So just because the app was activated by voice command doesn't mean you're allowed to talk. So always look for, you should remain silent if the app was launched directly by the tile, via a toast, via a secondary tile, or via a voice command where the, the mode was actually set to text. Instead now, how, of voice. tell me how that actually works in your apps. So, um, well, it's, it's basically the, the way that you've just explained it. So making sure that if you need to show feedback to the user, and it's, all, it's entirely dependent on the type of app that you're writing. So for example, if the whole reason for being of that app is to provide feedback that's audio, then like the audiobook sample I showed earlier, well, it's kind of a given at that point that the user probably wants to uh, hear the audio played back. But of course, since the text of the book is directly on screen, it's very fair that maybe the user wants to launch the app with voice command, and then they just want to read the text. Yeah. But if they launch, uh, if they vo launch it with voice commands using voice, then at that point they might want to just hear it. So then you can play it back. Are there scenarios where I would want to bring the user in the app, and I really don't need to switch between whether or not they spoke or typed because I always want to act as if they typed, like I always want to be silent? I'm sure there are scenarios out there. The thing is, every time I try to cover all the scenarios possible, uh, I always make sure that users can send me feedback and users keep educating me about, about how they're using my apps. And sometimes it's funny because you realize that your, your app had a certain intent and then later you realize people are using the app in a completely different way or in a different context. Yeah. And you're like, wow, I had never thought it would be useful in such a way. Yeah, in a later module, we're going to talk about the importance of testing when it comes to voice testing and testing with real users and with yeah. real scenarios. And um, I think that one really good test strategy for any app, but more specifically or more especially when you're dealing with voice, is to release your app to some beta, some subset yep. of the overall population. If you just put it in the store and it's available to everyone, everyone sees it, it's, it's maybe too much. If you can release it to a small subset of the population and then you can gather some feedback, use that feedback to, to drive the feature changes in, right. in the resulting app. And that's why, for example, everybody that's watching right now, they're all developers, they've all experienced like creating a UI and then releasing it to some users. And then users start using the UI in a way that they never thought possible. Because as a developer, of course, you know that you're supposed to click this first, this, this second, this third. Um, so it's kind of like ingrained in your brain that you're not gonna try the weird scenarios. Yeah. But users will always try the weird things. Yeah. Now imagine if there's no UI, the user can just say whatever they want. Yeah. So this, this is what you have to test for. Yeah. People will say quite a few interesting things. OK, well, let's actually look at a hard, cold example of yes. how to do this. I and mean, we looked at slides, but slides can lie, right? I, I didn't lie on my slides, of course, but <laughs> slides can lie. And here's the hard, cold example. The hard, cold example is Command Monkey. Command Monkey, the code is already up. It's available at github.com slash codefoster slash Command Monkey. Uh, you may not be familiar with TweetMonkey. I talked about it at the beginning, but if you're not, you can, you can feel free to go to codefoster.com slash TweetMonkey, and it might give you a little bit of context here. TweetMonkey is a blog article that I made where I took a, this is a maker project, I took this real monkey that I got at the novelty shop, hooked it up to an Intel Edison and a relay, and then the, on that Intel Edison, I'm running Node, so I'm running JavaScript on that, and I'm able to write an app that hooks into the Twitter streaming API so that whenever you tweet, hash tweet monkey, this guy goes clang, 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 and he goes off, and it's kind of fun, right? It's, fun, it's certainly fun to show at events. So that's tweet monkey, and I actually just last night finished my blog post on command monkey, tweet monkey's older brother, command monkey. So this is the architecture that I'm gonna be talking to you about right now in the slides, and you can go to my GitHub repository and get the code, and you can go to the blog post and you can see Command Monkey. So let's jump over to this architecture slide and get an idea for how this works. Now, this is a, a pretty involved architecture, and I'm only gonna talk about the voice commands right now. 
in a later module, in module six, I'm going to be talking about this full scope and how this is implemented. But right now, I just want to write the VCD with you, register it, and then handle the user's intent. Because, right. And it's very, very <clears throat> short, OK? So let's open uh, Visual Studio. Now, this is vanilla Visual Studio 2013, the community edition. So it's the free edition. Anybody can go to visualstudio.com and download it. There's one thing that I've added to this, and that is something called Node.js tools for JavaScript. Now, Node.js tools for, I'm sorry, for JavaScript, for Visual Studio. For Visual Studio. Node.js tools for Visual Studio is at nodejstools.codeplex.com. It's an excellent plugin that really lights up a lot of really cool Node scenarios, and I'll point those out as we go through them. So I'm going to hit New Project. Sounds like you're using Ultimate there, but oh, it does look like oh yeah, yeah. you're right. That is. But, but uh, in all fairness, everything here works yeah. with community, so yeah. you don't have to pay for anything. There you go. Thanks for pointing that out. Okay, now let me just go ahead and create a new project wherever the default location is fine. But in this case, for the name of the project, I'm going to call this. I'm going to call this Command Monkey. Dot, and this is just the phone project. That's the first project that I want to create. So I'm going to say dot phone. Now, I want my solution to just be called Command Monkey. So solutions contain multiple projects. And in this step, I'm actually doing two things. I'm creating a project and a solution, the containing solution. Right. So the project is uh, CommandMonkey.phone, and the solution is Command Monkey. But I don't want just a regular web app in Visual Studio. I want to go to C Sharp. And this is because I installed the Node.js oh, tools nice. for Visual Studio. I go to Node.js. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. That's for the subsequent projects. For this one, I actually want a store app Windows Phone app. Windows there Phone we go. app. Now I'm just going to do a blank one. And to be to be clear here, what we're building is a uh, a Windows Phone application because today voice commands only work on on Windows Phone. Yeah, that's right. So that's why there's no Windows Store equivalent with Windows 8.1. But coming with Windows 10, VCDs and the Cortana integration is coming to Windows 10. Yep, the same things you know today will go forward. Just get open you up on on new operating. Systems. And you heard it here for, uh, first. You heard it here first. Yeah. Maybe you didn't. If you watched the keynote, you didn't. But. Actually, they didn't talk about that. Oh, yeah? No. Oh, they, interesting. They, they, there was no developer stuff. So interesting. This, this is an exclusive. OK, so I have a project called commandmonkey.phone. And there is a, I, I need to create a VCD here. It's really easy. You just right click here and say, I want to add a new. And you could choose an XML file or whatever. I usually just choose text file and say, this is a vcd.xml. And so there's my VCD. It's blank. How am I going to fill that in? Should I type this in front of you all? Oh, please don't. No, please don't. <laughs> no. no, let's just grab it. And you can see how relatively simple it is. It's actually not a ton simpler than the MSDN sample, but there it is. Now, you, I do remember learning at the very beginning uh, that the XML tag at the beginning here is required. Otherwise, you will run into problems. You have right. to have that declaration. Here's my voice commands. And to be clear, also earlier when I was talking about the number of commands we can have, so to clarify here, you can have one or more command sets. So usually you'll create a command set per language. So you can have up to 15 command sets, Okay. one for each language, okay. basically. And then each command set can have 100 commands Interesting. in okay. it. And then you can also have phrase lists, as we've seen, that help you narrow down the words that you can say within a command. Okay. The phrase list can have 2,000 elements. Excellent. So it's you. So not enough to hold all great. movies that have ever been made. No, right? not all of them. But, but at least the, the ones playing most popular. But maybe the, the ones playing right now. Right. I think you're covered. Yes. There you go. Okay, mm -hmm. so I've got myself a command set, English only at this point. Um, I've my prefix is simply monkey. So the name of this app might be called Command Monkey, but I don't want people to have to say Command Monkey. I want them to be able to just say monkey. So I give a prefix of monkey. Now, the example is command the monkey. That's going to be reported to them in the, <laughs> in the uh, uh, what can I say. And I have one simple command here. The command example is dance. Now, the combination of the prefix and the example is what the user is going to see when they ask Cortana, what can I say? They're going to, this Cortana is going to report that you can say monkey dance in that order. Okay. <laughs> Now, the listen for is just a command. What is it that you're asking the monkey to do? Now, at this point, it's a little bit silly because my monkey is only capable of doing one thing. But I've designed this VCD with a couple of extra uh, phrase list right. items so that you know, maybe we had a, an IoT project where the monkey was capable of either dancing or chattering or whatever. Now, um, Cortana simply comes back with commanding. I'm doing it. I'm doing what, you, doing what you asked. But you can put whatever you want there. So there's my VCD. 
Now let me jump over to the, um, my sample code here. And I'm going to take you into the JS, default JS. And I'm going to show you that in the on activated, and I've got this on the blog, in the notes and everything, but you're going to put this at the beginning of the on activated function. So here's my on activated function. And at the beginning of that, it might be nice to make a little, uh, little comment. And you're going to paste all that in. And this is going to look in the this root directory of this project for vcd.xml. And it's going to load it. OK, nice and easy. Nice. Next step. Now, still in the default JS, we need to handle that. And we do that by looking at our handling for our activations. So here's the default if it was launched. That means they clicked on it from their start screen, OK? But we need to add an else if. <clears throat> else if they activated it by way of a voice command, then we want to do this. So let me just maximize this so you can see all the code there. So the command, I'm pulling that from this semantic interpretation, and I'm looking at the first um, command. Okay. So I'm pulling in, and remember, I put a variable in there. Let me jump back to that. I put a variable in there, and I know because I, this variable is mapped to this phrase list that it's either going to be dance or chatter or and chatter. nothing else. <clears throat> if I wanted it to be more arbitrary, I could use a phrase topic, but here I'm using a phrase list. But it's going to be dance or chatter. Now what I'm going to do is very simple. For this app, this is the entirety of the phone app, I'm going to do an HTTP GET request to a service that we have not yet created. 